Hey guys, good morning again. I'm Pastor Ken and welcome. Hey, where's everybody from last week? We forgot to tell them that Jesus is still living. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Well, guys, welcome. Thank you for being a part of today's celebration. And to all those that are tuning in online, thank you for taking time out of busy schedules to connect with what God's doing here at Vertical. We just welcome you one day to see you face to face. We love you and thank you for being a part of this. Well, guys, last week we began a series because talking about the subject of God, I call this re-God because it's regarding God. It's huge, but there's some New Testament realizations that we need to grasp. Because the Bible tells us in the New Testament some things that God is. And why it's important is because it's really revealed in the gospel. The message that the New Testament proclaims, that's good news to all men, gives us the ability to know and understand who God truly is. And, I, and so as we kind of partake of this subject, one of my favorite authors, A.W. Tozer, said this, and it's important to recognize. Tozer said this. I do need it, guys. I don't have this one memorized. Okay, here it comes. What comes to your minds when you think about God is the most important thing about us. In other words, the way we think about God really has impact about your life. Whether you run in fear, whether you hide in life, what do you believe about God? Because the what you believe about God really is the most important realization. Jesus said it this way, to know God is to know eternal life. Eternal life is to know God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. In other words, to live the life you were created by God to live. The New Testament brings this fascinating understanding to us, is that God can be known. He's personal. He's intimate. He's not just some, you know, being up out in the heavens somewhere, or like people you talk to and they say, you know, the man upstairs. No, no, no. Jesus revealed something about God that's so intimate. He said, God is Father. Now, some people struggle with that because their fathers may not have been good. They may have been evil people, and they still struggle seeing it. But, see, God is the perfection of what fatherhood is supposed to be. Someone who loves us, someone who cares for us, someone who's for us, someone who supports us, someone who wants us to succeed in life, someone who's invested in us, someone who's cheering us on, someone who is absolutely on our Side. And Jesus revealed him to us. Jesus set straight. Here was the question that human beings had been asking almost since the beginning of time. And that is, what is God like? And Jesus forever settled the question because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. See, Jesus revealed something that the Old Testament gave an allusion to. or uh, It was there, but nobody kind of saw it. It wasn't so clear. Because even in creation, there was a conversation. Okay, And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit said, let us make man in our image. In the image of God created he them, male and female. Well, wait a minute. There's one God, right? Yes. In three divine personalities. But if God made humankind in his own image, how could in the image of God he make them male and and female. And why did he ever say the male and the female together in marriage would be one? Hmm, something to think about. See, the Trinity is what became known. It's a Christian doctrine because the revelation of what Jesus, who he is, which wasn't really embraced or understood by his followers even until his resurrection from the dead. Because it almost defies the human logic. It almost... Uh, assaults the human brain, that God would show up in human form, that God would care enough about humankind to actually take the problem that was purely human and bring the solution that was purely divine. You see, you can't know, we talked about this last week, and it wasn't until the New Testament that a human being even began to conceive this idea that the essence of God is love. God is love, and most people today in the Western world Think that if there is a God, that God is love. But where did you get that understanding from? See, apart from the cross, you can't even begin to recognize or understand God's love. Why? Because how much more could God prove his love to humanity than to look at the cross of Jesus Christ? And so, in essence, Jesus made known. He recentered our world. 
Jesus is how we know and understand God. He made claims like this, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because what we see predicted is that the eternal Son, he's not the Father, but he was in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. See, when God is love, the understanding is that there had to be more than one entity to express and to know love as an eternal status. And so the Trinity is why God, humanity came into being. God wanted to share his life with humankind, and so he made man. So love is something, in essence, that shows that we see in Jesus because the eternal Son is the visible understanding for humanity of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. People get out of whack when they try to see it all the any other way. But the realization is if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Because like the Father is like the Son. They are one together. Got that? Well, today we're going to talk about something that's difficult. We're going to talk about something today that a lot of people stumble over. It can be a reason why people walk away from faith. It can be a thing that prevents people from coming to faith. And here's the big question. Look at the question that we're going to look at today. The question is this. Why would a good and loving God allow bad things to happen? If you know anything about the current uh, 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 state of this generation, this is the thing that people assail often. The idea of evil and injustice in the world give the idea is how can God be a good God? How can God be a loving God and allow evil and injustice to happen in our world? Now, today, this is deeply emotional because you may be here, you may have been hurt, you may have gone through difficulties, you may have experienced things that you didn't expect in life, and it's caused you to question because everybody sometimes asks the question, why did that happen? Doesn't God have the power to prevent that from happening? Why did that happen? So follow me. Because this assault has been one of the things that the new atheists have consistently railed against God. But the issue is this. The reason why, because injustice is something that nobody's happy with. Whenever a human being sees it, we have a problem with it, don't we? When we see evil and injustice, it proves, listen to me, my point is it proves that we're not just biology, chemistry, and physics. Because if the new atheists are right, and that, that the evidence of evil and injustice prove there's no God, then why would you even care? Because the last time I checked nature, nature is not just. You know, little, little, little gazelles don't go home and go, man, a lion ate mom today. That's so unfair. That's so unright. If you watch animal planet or anything like that. There's one thing about nature. None of it is just. In fact, if the atheists are right and, 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 and natural selection and it's just, you know, chemistry and biology, then why would we even care? Why would there be a sense of indignation in human beings? And why would that be your fodder to rail against God? If it wasn't, it's pointless to even argue. But it goes to show that we are made in the image and likeness of God because nobody's happy. When injustice occurs, right? And this is not a new question. This is a question that people have pondered and wrestled with. When you read the Old Testament prophets, they actually struggled with this issue. You read the book of Malachi. Malachi said, here's what was happening on the street. People were saying, man, it doesn't pay to serve God. Because it looks like the people who are evil, the people who are corrupt, are set up. And it looks like things are going well for them, and I'm struggling. Ever been there? That's something the human beings struggle with hugely. And like, where is God? Somehow it doesn't pay to serve God. And this is an issue of faith. Because the question becomes, okay, why doesn't God just eliminate all evil? If God is God, why doesn't he just do so? That's what people will say. If he could, he would. If he could, he should. In other words, God can't be both good and all-powerful. Because if he was all-powerful, why would he allow evil to continue in the world? Why would he allow injustice to go on in this situation? Or if he's loving, then he's not all-powerful, and he can't be all that. So here's the tension. And the prophets ask these questions. In fact, the prophet Habakkuk had as much, and I love it, this little book of Habakkuk, he 
It's like, God, don't you see? And he's worried. He's a prophet to the nation of Israel, and he's worried about the corruption of the Israeli leaders, that they were corrupt, they were allowing abominations into the temple, they had perverted the, the, the law of God, they were doing all this. God, don't you see? God, don't you care? That's what he's asking. And God says, yes, I see, and I have an answer, Habakkuk. I'm raised up the Babylonians, and they're going to exact judgment upon the Israelis. And Habakkuk thought about that for a minute, and he went, oh, wait, wait a minute. God, that don't make any sense. They're worse than us. And God said, don't worry about it. I'm going to judge them as well. Habakkuk, trust me. And that's why he wrote, the just shall live by faith. See, Jesus dealt with a parable about this issue one time. He said, listen, you need to be able to trust. Because why? And he told this story about a, a, a widow woman in his day, which was one of the most marginalized individuals around. She had no children, no husband, and she was looking for justice. And Jesus who's the master storyteller, tells a story that she went to a judge who didn't fear God nor regard man. I mean, you can't ask for a worse circumstance. And she's like, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And he said, just because I don't fear God nor man, but because I got to get her off my back, I'm going to give her what she asked for. And here's Jesus' point. Because his story wasn't like God's like the unjust judge. No, he said, will not God bring justice to his one, but will he find faith on the earth? Here's the point, and this is so emotional and so difficult. The question is, can we trust God to bring justice upon the earth? But st stay with me for a moment. Why do we ask the question in this regard? Think about this. Why do when we say, why would a loving and good God allow bad things to happen in the world? When we say that, what are we pointing at? All the bad that's out there, right? But I have a question. And I know this gets really personal, but listen. Have you ever done anything bad? Well, have you ever done anything you would actually equate as evil? Now, maybe we struggle with that. It's easier to find it in everybody else. It's harder to find it in a mirror. Right? Now, the question is this, and this is where it's personal, is this. If God were to eliminate evil, why didn't he stop you from doing what you did? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's easy, like I said, it's easier to look around. The problem was inside of us. The problem was us. So today, what we're going to look at is this. God is just. God could not be loving and not just. Because for all who do good, all who attempt to do what's right, all who, who, who play by the rules on that end, God owes justice to those ends. Okay. And so in essence, as we look at this today, the issue is that how can this, because what's fascinating, be honest with me, stay with me, be real with yourself. As a human being, okay, when we're hurt or when we see people we love hurt or we see things that we don't like, what do we want? We want justice, right? We have justice. Where's justice? Why would God allow this to happen? But when we're responsible for the hurt of someone else, when we're ones that brought the hurt and the pain, what do we want in that moment? Be honest with me. Do we want justice? Do we yell justice or do we yell what? Mercy, mercy right? We want mercy. Nothing that the human heart wants more when, it, when its guilt is exposed than mercy. Right? So here's my question. Does justice and mercy, are they compatible? Or do they negate one another? Do they clash against one another? Stay with me. Second, Second Thessalonians verse, chapter 1 and verse 6. This is where I pull this from. The New Testament makes statements that say God is. So we're talking about the nature of who God is. And here's what it says. God is just. You can rely on that. Now let me say something for a moment. I have no earthly idea what pain you may have experienced in life. You may be sitting out there, and maybe a spouse left you holding the bag. They traded you in for a younger model. Or they left you, they, they dished you, they cheated on you, they hurt you. I have no idea. Maybe somebody has abused you. Maybe stuff that's been done in the dark that is absolutely abominable, and you wonder, why has this happened? Where is justice? Where is God? Why has this happened to me? 
Maybe you've dealt with an illness or a sickness and it doesn't make sense because you're trying to do what's right and other people who aren't seem like they're living large and they're happy. Maybe you've been bullied in life. Maybe you're in school and you wonder, where is God? Why am I being picked on? Where is all, why is all of this happening? Where is God? I can tell you this. I may not know totally your pain, but you can be assured of this. The God of heaven knows your pain. And here's the good news. God is just. Because look what he goes on to say. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. You see, whether you realize this or not, nobody gets away with anything. As human beings, you may think that they got away. You may be tempted to realize, where is God? Let me tell you this. Nobody gets away with anything. Every human being has an appointment with Almighty God. Every one of us in this room. It's appointed to every man once to die and after that the judgment. We will all stand before God. And trust me, okay, that's part of the problem with being human. Because you know what happens? This idea that people have that, you know what, somehow, oh yeah, I'm good. When I stand before God, you know, we think that we can just tap off all the reasons why we did what we did and it's okay. Because we do that with loved ones, right? You hurt somebody you love and then you have every justification, rationalization, a reason why. They have no reason of being mad at you. Because if they understood you didn't mean to do it, like not meaning to do it, grant you a pass. The reality of it is this. God knows. And God said he will repay those who have troubled you. In other words, that's the problem. Don't try to be God. That's human being struggle. Because we have this, this is the stupidity, this is, this is the arrogance of humankind. If I were God, <laughs> are you kidding? I mean, come on, we pulled out, we said, if I were president of the United States, I would. It's so ignorant. You have no idea of the complexity of problems. From a distance, it seems so simple. Oh, I would just, you don't know what you would do if you were ever faced with all the facts. That's why people who rail and all that kind of stuff are just ignorant. I'd rather listen to a donkey bray, okay, than listen to some people talk. It's, you know, it's like I have to turn the news station most of the time because it ain't news. It's commentary. And it's like, oh, my goodness. Lord, it wasn't just a Balaam that heard an ass speak. I just heard. I'm not sorry. I'm not, it's like, wow. Sometimes we as human beings can say stuff that's so ignorant. It's so arrogant. Sorry, I don't want to defend anybody. But it's just real, okay? You don't mind if I be real with you. That's the arrogance of humankind. We're like, if I were God, excuse me, I'm glad you're not. But God said, I will repay trouble. And notice, there's second, second side of this. Verse, verse 7. And I will give relief to those, to those who are troubled. See, what you can know is this, that Jesus came as your solution. And I don't know what pain you've gone through, but I know this, you don't have to remain in the situation you're in. Because with Christ, there is redemption. There is restoration. One of the most powerful realizations of the New Testament is not only did God, Jesus said, the anointing that's upon me, I came to heal the brokenhearted. And what you can recognize is to live for God today. The Bible says godliness is a promise, not only of the life that now is, but in the life that is to come. The Christians have this realization, the doctrine of the resurrection is that no matter what you've experienced in this present life, God has promised that a day is coming when all will be reversed, that there won't even be a memory of what was done because the glory of what God does in you will be so overwhelming. The, he said it this way, this momentary trouble that we deal with today has nothing in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us. God said, no matter what, if you believe in me, if you trust in me, trust me, I will reverse it all. See, this idea that good things can't happen or bad things can't happen to good people is not Christian. I don't know where this came from. It's skewed because, listen, if the idea that good things would never happen to bad people was Christian, I, I, first of all, the very thing we celebrated last week, Okay, that the best person who ever lived had a terrible miscarriage of justice happen to him. So Christianity is founded not on the idea that bad things never happen to good people. 
In fact, the followers of Jesus endured immense evil and injustice in their generation, but they trusted that God was faithful. No matter what they endured in this present life, that God was bigger than what they were, that there was an eternity, and that God would reverse it all. And so the question becomes, okay, God will trouble those who trouble me. God will relieve when? 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 When, Pastor Ken? When? Well, he answers that. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire and with powerful angels. You see, you and I need to realize the question, why doesn't God just eliminate all evil now? He is appointed today. And can I say this? If you're a Christian here, please understand something. And I'll challenge anybody on this level. God is appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Okay? And all the Christians that go around saying that natural disasters, problems that occur, hurricanes, tsunamis, where God's judgment are just misguided. It is not true. Sorry to tell you that. Because when God does it, there will be nobody questioning who did what he did. Dead. Okay? Just, you, you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Because you and I need to realize this. God said it will happen in a day. And why is that? Because here's the point. All the people who want justice, all the ones that are railing and saying, why is God allowing evil? And that's what, if you're taking notes, this is so important. And that is, injustice necessitates judgment. Injustice necessitates judgment. In other words, there will be no justice without judgment. And that freaks out this generation. That's what makes people run for cover. Oh, no, I don't want to believe in a God that judges. No, I don't want to believe. Where is justice? But there is no justice without judgment. And God says there will be a day when everything will be revealed. Nothing will be in secret. All things will be made naked and open. All things will be uncovered. And God will judge all things. He has said, I will bring it all to light. And there can be no justice without judgment. In fact, Paul said this to these, these people in Athens, these intellectuals that he was talking to in Athens. Paul says this, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, talking here about Jesus. That God has set a date in other words, God's not judging before that date. God has set a date where he will, he will judge the world in justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given proof of this. How? For everybody raising him from the dead. Jesus is whom God turned all judgment over to. And his resurrection is why you can trust God is just and that God will deal with all that needs to be deal, dealt with. He's God and he knows how to do what he is called to do. He's just and he will judge the world in justice according to the one. But why has God turned this all over to Jesus? If you're taking notes, listen, this is so important to know. God gave judgment to Jesus because he understands what it's like to be human. This is what Jesus said of himself in John, John's gospel, John chapter 5. It says, for God the Father has life in himself, and so he granted the Son also to have life in himself. Verse 27. And he has given him authority to judge. In other words, God the Father turned all judgment over to the Son. Why? Why has God the Father given Jesus authority to judge? Because he is the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus alone knows what it's like to be us. Jesus was tempted in every way like we are. It's just he never gave in. He never sinned. But nobody knows us like Jesus. Nobody understands you like Jesus. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be, to be uh, 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 abandoned. He knows what it's like to be mistreated. He knows what it's like. There's nobody that can help you like Jesus because no matter what you've suffered with, no matter what you've dealt with in this life, trust me, when you understand the sufferings of Christ, he has been there and done that and he is well able to help you. But here's the good news. And why did God do it? You know, I was raised Roman Catholic, okay? 
And this never made sense to me as a, as, a, as a Roman Catholic. When married couples would go to the priest for help with their marriage, I'm like, what does he understand about marriage? Okay, he's celibate. I mean, he's never been married. And it's hard to receive help from someone what? That we don't think understands where we're at, right? Why do addicts, the best way to get help for someone who's addicted to something is someone who's been there and overcame, right? Why is AA so successful? Because people who were once addicted to alcohol help one another and give hope to one another that I can overcome the situation through God's help. See, in other words, we identify with people that relate to us, right? And I'm being human on that. God understands us better than we understand ourselves. So the one he gave judgment is the one who understands. The one who's been there. The one who understands what it means to be human. Jesus was human in every way that we are human. But yet he is God in every way that the Father is God. And God said he's the perfect candidate to be the judge of the world. See, whoever judges humankind knows what it means to be human. But here's the point. Why doesn't God eliminate all evil now? Why does he wait? Because before God chose to eliminate evil, he first placed it on his son so we might live. If God were to eliminate all evil right this moment, where would we be? See, it's easy to look at it at everybody else. But what about, see, God wanted to deal with the evil that's in us first. Because why? Why did God wait? Why does God not choose right now to eliminate all evil? Because he first placed it on Jesus because God loved us and wanted to give an opportunity for guilty sinners to have a way to redemption. God wanted to provide an opportunity for those who had been evil to find relief, that there was an answer, there was a solution, that God Almighty knew and understood. And he gave Jesus the opportunity, Jesus, trust me, Jesus, like I said this last week, Jesus didn't come to save you from God. He came to save you from the problem that all humankind had, which is sin. And Jesus took that upon himself to give guilty sinners a way out, a way to salvation. See, the good news, the gospel, that's why I'm doing this series. You can't really know God apart from the gospel. You can't really understand. Why didn't God immediately deal with it? Because All of us would have been impacted and affected. And Jesus came to give humankind an opportunity. Here's what the scripture says. Romans 3. Paul is highlighting this. The gospel so concisely put in the sun. Because he started this whole idea that nobody will be made righteous according to the law. Nobody trying to save yourself is capable of doing that. Okay. By the knowledge of the law, we are conscious of our sin. Why did God even give the law to begin with? The New Testament tells us that. The the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was proof to humanity you can't save yourself. As much as you try, as many times as you promise you'll never do it again, you will do it again. Why? Because you are human and you needed a savior. God didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Here was the good news. Before God sent a judge, he first sent a savior. Jesus, when he came the first time, said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. And that's what Paul brings out here. He says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, in other words, to be right with God, has been made known to which the law and the prophets. When it says the law and the prophets in the New Testament, it's talking about the old covenant. The old covenant. The law and the prophets testify what God is saying, that there is a righteousness of God apart from the law. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Could there be any fairer opportunity that Jesus died for the whole world? Why? To give choice to every human being. Because all of us, if we're honest, recognize that the problem is in us. It's easier to see what's around us. But God says, no, 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 no. It's not just around you. It's in you. And I love you enough to provide a way out. And so here, the righteousness given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Why? For all have sin. In other words, we're all guilty. Let me tell you this. If you're a Christian, please 
Never present yourself to people who are not as superior. There is nothing superior to you. We are all sinners that were saved by grace. We didn't warrant it. We're not better than anybody else. We're just forgiven. We're just made right, not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did. Please tell the good news. Please tell people that Jesus died for everyone, to give choice to everyone. Why? Because we were all guilty. We're all in the mess together. But God loved us and sent his son because why? Jesus was the only purely righteous one. He's the only one that ever lived on this earth and perfectly and totally fulfilled any requirement God ever had. And then willingly gave his life on behalf of all of us. He gave his perfection. His right standing with the Father. He gave that freely in exchange for all of our sin, for all of our guilt. It's a story that's almost too good to be true. But it is the power. See, until you see it in its essence, you will never value and love God in the value that you should. Because the gospel is such amazing news. It's just become too, we, we've been around it too long, we become jaded. We almost forget the realization that everything we have is because of God's goodness. We didn't deserve a bit of it. God gave it freely. Why? For all of us has sinned. We all had fallen short of the glory of God. But what? But we are justified, listen, freely. It's not anything we earn. It's a gift that's offered to humanity. That's why it's by choice, freely, by his grace. Through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. See, he died to buy us back. God presented Christ as the sacrifice of atonement. Through the shedding of his blood. To be received by faith. See, the question is, will you believe in what you do or will you believe in what he did? That's the choice humanity. You can either stand in your own righteousness or believe in the one that Christ freely provides. But you can't buy it. You can't earn it. It only comes as a gift. And it's that humility to realize is I don't deserve this, but I'm humbled by what God is offering. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, and this is where people all get, they rail against God. Well, why does God not deal with this right now? Why is all this problems? Why is all this evil in our world and God not dealing with it? Because in his forbearance, he left sins committed beforehand unpunished. Verse 26. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be, listen, just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now listen, was Jesus' death on the cross just? Come on. Was Jesus' death on the cross just? And the answer is no. It was a gross miscarriage of justice. He was the only innocent one who ever lived. But humanity poured out its contempt upon God. But yet... So Jesus' death was what, listen to me, God is just because he offers the injustice of Jesus' death in exchange for giving people who deserve it the freedom to be released from their debt of sin. you got to be kidding me. Why would God allow us off the hook? Why would God not hold us responsible for our evil and injustice because he on Jesus gave the opportunity for a divine exchange. Give me your injustice and I'll exchange the injustice of Jesus and give you his perfect life in exchange. Like I said, it's almost too good to be true. And who can hold anything against God? Because Jesus, if he is what the scripture says he is, if he's God in a bod, then him standing in for all humankind, all of human sin combined cannot even equal the injustice of what Jesus suffered on our behalf. And here's the freedom. Here's the opportunity. The exchange, the choice is yours. Because if you're taking notes, this is so important. Listen, the gospel declares that in Jesus, justice and mercy exist for all. See, the only time these two seemingly extremes, seemingly uh, non-compatible uh, realities came together because the injustice of Jesus hanging on the cross on behalf of us was the freedom of God to offer mercy to whoever believes. You see, until you look at the cross and recognize that's how much I matter to God, that's how much God loved me, 
that in my guilt and in my sin, I put Jesus on that cross, but God didn't come to condemn me. He came to save me. He offered Christ on my behalf, and Jesus willingly gave himself on our behalf because he loved us. That's almost inconceivable to the human mind. Islam says that's uh, an absolute abomination, that Allah is too pure and holy, that that could not be. That doesn't make sense to religious people. But it is purely good news to the guilty sinner that God provides mercy to whosoever will. The door has been opened wide. Humanity has a choice. So the choice that lay before all of us is that you can either receive the righteousness of Jesus and believe in him and him alone. That the only See, when you ask people on the street, are you going to heaven? Here's what people will say, well, I'm a good person. Of course I'm going to heaven. So they, because we're assessing, we tend to judge ourselves based on looking at everybody else. But you see, the fact of the matter is, all of us were guilty. God offered his son freely. And we can either stand in the righteousness of Jesus and trust in him and what he did, or we can stand in our own righteousness. We can stand by our own track record. And I love this. The Old Testament prophet said this, if God were to mark iniquities, who could stand? See, that's the problem. It's easier when you're looking at all the bad things out there and never even giving credence to the bad things in here. But you see, God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son. He put the evil of the world on Jesus so that whosoever will, here's the door wide open. Here's the good news to humankind, that there is a choice. The choice is before you. You can either embrace Jesus or you can stand on your own. And here are there are many that will stand on their own. Many that will come before God believing that they're owed heaven because of their good lives. And here's what the scripture says in Revelation 20. It says, and I saw a great white throne. And who's the one sitting on the throne? That's Jesus. Why? Because all judgment was given over to him. And I saw a great white throne and to him who's seated on it. And the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. And there was no place for them. And then look at this. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. Now, you got to remember the people in whom this was written to. God speaks to us. It's like if a five-year-old asks you where the children come from, you point to mommy's belly. But that's not a good answer for a medical student. Right? So if you think our surveillance equipment is cutting edge, you have no idea that God not only recorded everything we've ever done in our life, but he recorded it in technicolor. He recorded it with your thought, your intention, and the purpose, and the thing you've never confessed to anybody else, but have hidden in your own heart. God said, everything is naked and open unto me. God will judge every single human being. Imagine watching that video when you did what you did, and the reason you did it is exposed, it's open, it's out. There's no secrets anymore. OMG, are you kidding me? Yes, God. He said this, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. See, there's a choice. Listen to me. The dead were judged according to what, what they had what? Done. Not what they intended to do or not intended to do. Not all the justification rationale, what we had done. And it was recorded in the books. In other words, God shows it back to us, HD+. Plus. Okay? But notice this, you see, at the moment that we claim, no, nah, I'm good, when you watch a videotape of your whole life, they watch the way you treated your mom, oh, you don't bring that up again? They, try, they watch when you went along with your friends and made fun of somebody else because you didn't want to look like you weren't in part of that and you didn't stand up for the broken. Ooh, you really going to go there? Are you kidding me? If you want God to look at it all, like I said, it's easier to look at everybody else, okay? But God plays it all. At that moment, who is not guilty? At that moment, when you can't say, well, I didn't mean to do so, and you're, play that back in. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show them. Yeah, I'm going to. And right? And you're like, whoa, talk about being naked. Whoa. And so they, but look at this. Final judgment, though, isn't anything about what you've done. Look at what it points to. Verse 15, anyone whose name was now found written in the book of life. In other places, it's called the Lamb's book of life. See, at the moment you put your trust in Jesus, your name is recorded 
in the book of life. And what causes eternal life for us? It's faith in Jesus and Jesus only. Nobody gets to heaven based on what they did. They get to heaven because of the one whom they trusted. That their sin and unrighteousness was paid by the one who hung on the cross. God's final judgment for humankind is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Because whoever's name was not found written in the book was thrown into the lake of fire. Now all the people who push back, all the people who have issue, all the people who say, Pastor Ken, you're just trying to scare people. No, I'm not. The problem is not God. If we're honest, the problem is us. And God put Jesus over judgment. Why? Because listen to me. You can rail, you can say anything you want to say on this life, but the day you stand before the one who died on your behalf, the one you stay before Jesus who knows exactly what it means to be human, when Jesus judges human life, you know what he will do? To all those that say, this is unfair, this isn't right. No, I don't believe that. He will step off the throne, take the robe that he's in, take it off, display to them his back. Show them his hands that still bear the nail prints that are in them. And look at them and say, what more could I have done? A broken-hearted God gives to human beings exactly what they choose. Nobody is in, separated from God because of God's choice. No, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, the call is out, come home. I made a way for guilty sinners to find salvation and freedom. And I gave them the ability, allow me to be just and the justifier of them that believe. But if you choose not to believe, if you think you can do it on your own, then you will gain for eternity, what you've always wanted, which is existence without me. See, what we take for granted in humankind, that there is, as much as we live in a broken and fallen world, there's still the emblems of God's goodness all around us. We have no earthly idea what it means to be absolutely absent from the goodness of God. And the concept of eternity, let, let me, listen to me, if you're a Christian, don't talk about hell when you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? The reality is God isn't torturing people. That is not the God in whom we love. What God said is that he gives human beings, if you don't want existence with me, then you can be separate from me. And where torment comes down is, have you ever been there before? You ever have people where you feel you didn't get what you deserved and they eat themselves up with anger and, 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 and vitriol and, and, and just... Human beings, you want, you want existence without God? You can have it. God will provide it. It's not what you think it is. But if that's what you want, if you don't want God in this present life, what would you, what's the imbecility of the human mind to think that you would want him outside of this life? God has given human beings every opportunity. Why? Because he loves us. If the cross doesn't prove the love of God to human beings, there is nothing else that can. And a broken-hearted God will allow human beings because he's always given us the, the opportunity to choose for ourselves. And if that is our choice, as brokenhearted as God is, will grant to human beings life absent from his presence and from his goodness and everything he is. And it is nothing what human beings ever bargain for. And that's the real, God is just. So if you can trust this, let God begin to heal you from the inside out. You see, the evil and injustice has been done to you. God in heaven knows. That's why Christ came. He came to heal. He came to restore. But don't get eaten up with all the area of your anger and vengeance. You know, calling on God to do something that you don't even understand. Just trust that he's God. He is just. He will trouble those who have troubled you. He will relieve. He will restore. He will turn your situation around if you let him. Because God is love and God is just. But ju you can trust that God is just. Let God be God. And just be true that I'm not. I trust 
that you got me. I trust for eternity. You've got my best. 